word. Well, in October of last year, we all experienced really a historic moment. And in October of last year was the month uh, in which Queen Elizabeth died. She had been on the throne for 70 years. And so it's historic because for most of us, and certainly for many, if not most, of the people in Britain, she was the only monarch that they ever knew. And so to have this switch over of the monarch uh, is a unique event. And so some of you may have been uh, aware of and uh, participated in viewing the coronation of Charles III last month. And really, I think it's kind of likely, this is a pretty impressive 70 years on the throne, uh, it's likely that we will probably see another changeover. You know, Charles is in his 70s, and so it's very possible that we will see a monarch change again. And so Charles, and then presumably Andrew, will become the next king. They are kings and queens in a long line of kings and queens. And yet, the event of her death reminds us, and we all understand, that no monarch's throne and rule is forever. In fact, the British Empire will not stand forever. At some point, it will fall. The monarchy will fall. The United States will fall at some point. Right? Things don't last forever in rule. Today, we're going to look at Psalm 110. It was one of the readings, uh, if you are participating in your reading schedule, uh, I noticed that many of the readings, most of the readings are in the Psalms, and one of the Psalms in there was Psalm 110. So we're going to be looking at Psalm 110 this morning. Now I want to give, being, being an educator, uh, I, I had a seminary professor that, that uh, would also preach uh, at times, and he, his response was, uh, in regards to preaching, was, well, preaching to me is just teaching, but just louder, right? <laughs> so, so I'm not necessarily going to be louder, but uh, I do like to include uh, components of teaching, um, as well as, and the more important thing, being impacted by God's word. So I do want to do a little bit of an intro to the Psalms, not knowing if uh, anyone has done that with you uh, recently. But the Psalms in, in the Bible, I think simply could be described as a collection of songs used in the musical worship of God. It would be similar to a modern day hymnal. Or maybe a better way would be to say the hymnal is a reflection, is similar to the collection of psalms that we see in the Bible. It functions the same way. But that kind of description is, is, is pretty simplistic And uh, when we talk about the psalms in Scripture. So in his book, Psalms, Rejoice the Lord is King, by Jim Johnston, who's the senior pastor, friend uh, of mine, but he's a senior pastor at Camelback Bible. He helpfully in this book ex explains and expands the, the definition of what the Psalms are. And he writes, the Psalms first are truth, and we have to remember that. This is not just a collection like the anthology uh, collection of the Beatles, right? Uh, this is truth. This is inspired writing it is the word of God these songs are the inspired word of God second of all the Psalms are Torah now Torah simply means often gets translated in our Bibles as being law the Torah is the the law but really the meaning of that is more of the instruction okay the Torah is the instruction that God gives to his people 
many times in the, in the way of do this or don't do this, right? But it's instruction about who he is and who we are as his people and how we are supposed to relate with him. So the Psalms are truth. The Psalms are Torah. In fact, the, the Psalms are the most quoted part of the Old Testament of the Hebrew Bible in the New Testament. Now, there's a lot of quotes from the prophets like Isaiah and stuff like that, but the, but Psalms, the Psalms are the most quoted uh, by Jesus and by the apostles in the New Testament. In fact, uh, you did a Psalm this morning, but uh, the reading um, from Hebrews, right? There's lots of connections there uh, to uh, the Psalms in, in the Old Testament. So the Psalms are truth, the Psalms are Torah, or instruction. They're poems, okay? They are poetry and music. And the benefit of that is that poetry and music often speaks to our hearts and our emotions and our minds and gives us a venue for remembering things. There are songs that if you just heard a few notes, you would, they would all come right back to mind, right? Um, that's the value of music and poetry, and the Psalms are poems. Also, the Psalms are a book. That is, it's a compilation of a whole bunch of different songs, and this book or this compilation is actually split into sub-books, into five different books that include a variety of psalms, types of psalms, and they're purposely organized. We don't necessarily know why they were organized the way they were, but they're purposely organized. That is, this is not just a chronological thing of this psalm was the first one done, so that's Psalm 1, and then Psalm 2 is the second one that was done. No, there, there were people who crafted and put together the different books of the psalms, and it was used in the worship uh, for the Israelite people, right? Used for worship in the temple. So it's organized and assembled into the structure that we now have. Now, we don't know exactly when that happened. It's very possible it happened after the Babylonian exile and possibly by Ezra, but there's really no scholarly consensus on all of the, the when, why, or who of its configuration. Beyond that, the structure that we have uh, was set before the time of Jesus' incarnation. So truth, Torah, or teaching is poems. It's a book. And most importantly, the Psalms are ultimately a book about Christ as king, about Jesus as the king. The Psalms and I would argue the whole of the Old Testament is pointing forward to the coming of God the Son, Jesus taking on flesh, and his work of redemption, his death, his resurrection, his ascension. The Old Testament is all, are all pointing towards that. And then the New Testament points back to that and gives explanation about what that's about. This is the means of our salvation. And then we have Revelation at the end, right, that looks forward uh, to some other things. But most importantly, the book of Psalms are ultimately a book about Jesus, about the Christ as king. Now, why do I say this? Well, uh, it's because it makes sense because Jesus talks this way. Right? So in Luke 24, you don't have to turn there um, yet, but Luke 24, uh, Jesus says, he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. He's talking with, uh, with his uh, disciples, the apostles. And he says, um, and this is after his resurrection, he meets them and he says, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, okay, that's basically the Torah, right? The instructions of Moses, the first five books of the Bible. 
and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So Jesus splits up the, the Torah, the instruction of Moses, the prophets, and then he says, the Psalms were talking about me and had to be fulfilled. So Psalm 110 is one of the best places in the Psalms to see this notion conveyed that the psalms are pointing to God's people, they're pointing God's people to Christ the anointed one, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So if you have your Bibles with you, I would uh, invite you to open them up to Psalm 110. Easy way to get there, basically split your Bible in half if you've got the New and Old Testament. And you're going to probably hit Psalms or Isaiah. If you hit Isaiah, you just go to the left a little bit. But otherwise, you're going to probably hit Psalms because they sit basically right in the center um, of our Bibles most of the time. I'd like to read through the psalm first uh, because we haven't done that yet. It's not very long, but this is what it says. A psalm of David. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Now, one of the first things that you may notice here is that this psalm uh, has a title. And the title of Psalm 110 is a Psalm of David. Now this is not uh, an uncommon thing in the Psalms. Many Psalms have titles. And these titles are actually uh, part of the Psalm. Some of the titles tell who wrote it. Sometimes it tells uh, what instrument should be used to, to when, the, when the song is sung in worship. Sometimes uh, it tells what kind of tune to play it to. Now, we don't know what those tunes are, but the titles give some further explanation uh, and information about the psalm. Just a side note, sometimes you'll see uh, the titles will sometimes be marked as a zero verse. As most of the time, we start with verse one. Here, as the example, the Lord says to my Lord. Sometimes Bibles will put the title as a zero uh, mark. But I, I think I've said this before when I'm here. Remember that chapters and, and verse markings in the Bible were not there in the original. Uh, they're added in the Middle Ages as a real help to us to be able to reference where stuff is at. So super helpful, but in the original uh, writings, both in the Old Testament Hebrew and the New Testament Greek, there, there aren't verse markings or even chapter markings. But interestingly, the Psalms are the only place that actually do have numbers in the Old Testament. So Psalm 1 is Psalm 1, in the oldest manuscripts we have, and uh, everything we know is that they were there when they were compiled together. So the numbers of the Psalms are there. The Psalms are numbered. But the titles, right, are part of the Psalm. And this is super important in our Psalm today. Right. So as we read this first line of the song, it becomes clear that David is the writer of the psalm, and he's writing as king, but he's also writing as a prophet. 
Why do I say that? Because the Hebrew term here, when it says in our translation, the Lord says, the Hebrew words there are the same words that get used throughout the prophets to uh, make a statement of God's declaration. Now, most of the time, it shows up at the end of, uh, of a sentence. So there's a statement, and then it says, the Lord declares. It's a prophetic statement. Okay? Here it happens first, so we might be able to translate this, the Lord declares, and then go on from there. So this is a prophetic kind of uh, statement that David is presenting, so David is acting as a prophet. So let's look here at the first verse. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Again, a little step back. Probably most of your translations uh, have the Lord, the very first uh, utterance of Lord there, is often put in large uh, or in capital letters throughout. Does everyone have uh, large letters in your translation? Whenever you see that, recognize that that's actually uh, the word that would be in the Hebrew is Yahweh. It's God's name for himself. When he speaks to Moses in the burning bush, and Moses says, who shall I say sent me? God says, tell them that I am sent you. And, and this is where the, the, the term or the name Yahweh comes from. There's a whole history of why it gets translated Lord this way, that you can, if you're interested, you can ask me afterwards. But whenever you see the all caps Lord, that's Yahweh, that's God, okay? So Yahweh declares to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now, the New Testament this verse might seem a little bit strange. David is writing, and he says, the Lord declares to my Lord. So what are we to do with this? Now, if we, were, uh, if we didn't have the New Testament, we might wonder and ponder, what is David doing here? The beauty is the New Testament interprets this for us. So Jesus is the descendant of David, and he's the one who gives the meaning of this composition of David that was written some thousand years before Jesus was uh, in, in his ministry. And here, there are a number of examples of this in all the Gospels, and it also shows up in Acts. But I'm just going to pick one, Matthew 22, 41. I read part of it before, um, uh, of chapter 22. And this is what it says. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, saying, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that David, in the spirit, calls him Lord, saying, and here's our quote from Psalm 110, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? Right? Just to make us think. We should slow down and think. Think about the, the Pharisees who were pressing Jesus, and Jesus comes back with a simple question that befuddles them. And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him more questions. And so Jesus actually tells us what this means is that the Christ Jesus the son of David was actually being talked about a thousand years earlier when David is prophesying saying Yahweh declares and uh, says to my Lord so the Lord of David right and Jesus is taking uh, is claiming that spot Peter does the same thing in a sermon in Acts 2 and 3, or Acts 2 predominantly, during Pentecost. 
And he says, this Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend to the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So I think without conflict or any sort of special pleading, I think we can say that Psalm 110 is a psalm about Christ. We don't really need to question that, although it's a valuable thing to ponder how that all works. But the question that we do want to pose this morning is what does the psalm tell us about Christ? About the Lord of David. So let's look again at at this text and see how it answers that question. And I think we can see three things in the first four chapters. It's going to tell us that Christ sits with Yahweh victoriously. That is, he sits at his right hand victoriously and rules as God. Secondly, it's going to show us that Christ has ultimate rule over all people. And then the first four verses, thirdly, I think it's going to show us that Christ is a permanent priest and king, but permanent priest. So verse 1, Yahweh declares to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So the idea here is sitting at the right hand of God and being in control over all things. It's interesting here, David is writing and prophesying, and there's this idea of a process. Sit at my right hand until all of these things are dealt with, your enemies are dealt with. And we don't have time, but if we were to take one step back to uh, Psalm 109, we would see uh, a representation of the enemies of God, enemies of the Son, right? to the point where they're, they are, the enemies are calling to kill the son. So, so Psalm 109 can be viewed as being the enemies against God who kill the son, right? That that is a picture of Jesus' death. And then we have the resurrection in Psalm 110 and his ascension where he sits at the right hand of God. So, uh, interesting connections there. But here, Yahweh says, sit at my right hand and I will make your enemies your footstool. So, one of the things we can notice here is that there are enemies. In fact, we see two different kinds of people here. Well, actually, let me take a step back because I do want to talk about the footstool. That's a, that's a weird picture for us, right? But the idea is a ruler subdues, rules over, and controls, right, his enemies. There are old pictures, very old pictures, of a footstool of a king sitting down with his feet on a stool, and under that stool are people that are holding up the stool. It's this picture of uh, this of being lower than the dirtiest thing on the king's feet, right? The lowest, most humble part of the, of the king, his feet, right? Which is still in many countries objectionable to show the bottom of your feet to people, right? So the idea is that his enemies have been brought lower than the lowest thing in his feet, and they're holding up his feet. That's the picture of the footstool, and it gets used regularly. So there are enemies, though, but these enemies do not diminish the rule of Christ. His rule is mighty. So while there are enemies, what we will see, let's go to verse 2, the Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Okay, that's a picture of a powerful rule. And he says, rule in the midst of your enemies. So that's one group of people, the enemies against the son, enemies against the king. But then in verse 3, we have your people will offer themselves freely 
on the day of your power in holy garments. We've got this contrast of the enemies of God with now the people that are the king's people who offer themselves freely. The word really there is used as the same idea as a free will offering. They give gladly and thanks to the king because he's the king. And they will do that in holy garments. This is a picture probably uh, that we can have some understanding of when we go way to the end of the New Testament in Revelation, where there are a number of places that talk about the people who are, are God's people are wearing white robes or white clothes. This idea of it's the righteousness of God that they are wearing, clothing yourselves in righteousness. We see that in the New Testament too. So we have two people, we have enemies of God, but we also have those that are his people that freely worship, right? And the idea of worshiping in spirit and in truth. And they're wearing the righteousness of God. Revelation 3 says, uh, yet you have a st uh, still few names in Sardis. This is when... Uh, uh, there's the letter to the church in Sardis. These are people who have not soiled their garments and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before the angels. And it's just one example, Revelation 3, 4. And then this section ends here, so in holy garments, from the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. This is hard to really uh, kind of translate um, and, and know what it's meaning. It's very possible that it was, uh, it's an idiomatic statement, a statement that would have been understood by the Hebrew reader or singer of the song, but that doesn't get used today. But it does, I think, paint enough of a poetic picture to give us an idea that this king is going to be energetic, never lose power, kind of a, a youthful vibrance, right? We might say for uh, us older folks, vim and vigor, right? Uh, vim and vigor. Uh, maybe for the younger ones among us, maybe a, like an energetic emoji, right? Or the Energizer Bunny. There, there's like no stopping it. It will be new every morning, and this king will never lose his strength. He will be renewed. Youth will be yours. So we've seen that Christ, the Christ, will sit at Yahweh's side victoriously on the throne, that Christ has ultimate rule over the, all people, whether enemies or those people that are his. And now in verse 4, we see that this Christ is a permanent priest and king. So verse 4 says, The Lord has sworn it. That is, this is a promise, a covenant. The Lord has sworn it and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, I don't know if it was uh, purposeful, but it was a great reading that we did, the responsive reading, talking about the Christ, talking about Jesus being the perfect high priest, right? Who is forever, who never needed or needs to offer sacrifices for himself first before he does for the people in that he living a sinless life gave himself as the once for all sacrifice no other one needs to be be done he did that for his people so he's acting as priest so that's the picture here that the writer of hebrews is looking back to this and back to Genesis chapter 14, which is the connection to here, this weird thing, right? You're a, a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So what is that about? 
Well, Melchizedek is a person, and he's seen in Genesis chapter 14. The name Melchizedek, Melech in the Hebrew is king, and Zadok is righteousness. He's the king of righteousness. And in Genesis 14, we see Melchizedek is the king of the city of peace, or Jerusalem. Now, this is all before there's even an Israelite people, right? It's Abraham who meets him. It's before there's uh, uh, Israel, and Jacob, before the people of, of uh, Israel are even formed. Abraham meets Melchizedek, and Melchizedek is a king. He's also a priest of the God Most High, of God Most High. So, Melchizedek is this picture that not much is known about. He just shows up, right? But he's functioning as king and as priest at the same time. So this is the picture that, that uh, God declares, Yahweh declares, through uh, David in his prophecy, that you will be, you, meaning the Christ, Jesus, will be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. You will be king. You will be priest forever. The forever word there is important, and it points us back again to earlier writing in the Old Testament, 2 Samuel 7, in which God promises to King David that he will have someone of his lineage on the throne forever right forever and this doesn't make sense in the in the human experience of the old testament because after david is solomon after solomon and because of solomon the really the kingdoms are split and there are subsequent kings most of them are bad kings some of them are okay kings but in the end both the northern kingdom of israel and the southern kingdom of israel are destroyed in 722 and 586 BC. There is no more king. From that time on up until today, there has not been a king in the physical Israel that we know. So how can this be? Did God lie? Did his promise not come true? Here it says the Lord has sworn, sworn and will not change his mind. This king is going to be a priest forever, okay, in the order of Melchizedek. But it all makes sense when we look at this as there truly is a king on the throne from the line of David forever. That king is Jesus, right? The king is Jesus, and he functions as king. He functions as priest, and we won't get into it here, but he also functions as a prophet, right? These three offices of, of the Christ, of the anointed one. So a king, priest, and prophet. So this king will be a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Making sense so far? Okay, good. There's a little bit of shift here in Psalm 110 now. I think we can read the first four verses as being a prophetic statement, an oracle, a declaration of Yahweh that David is presenting. But verse 5 seems to be a shift. It changes how it's written and seems to be David now reflecting the things that he heard and proclaimed in the first four verses. He reflects them back to God saying, yes, this is the way it is, essentially. So let's look at uh, verses 5 through 7. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. So you can see some sort of uh, imagery that follows through 
David's making the statement, the sure statement now of the Lord is at your right hand. Okay, notice the Lord there is not all caps. So he's talking about the my Lord of, of verse one. This Lord is at your right hand. That is, he's ruling. And he will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. That is, he will rule powerfully and subdue his enemies. He will fill them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. You could say the whole earth. This is not just localized to Jerusalem or one place, but the whole earth. This king has rule over the whole earth. And there will be no kingdom, no king, no person in power that will outlast this king. They will all fall. And then verse 7, reminiscent of uh, the end of verse 3, he will drink from the brook by the way, therefore he will lift up his head. The idea of being refreshed. Right? He will not tire of this. He will not tire of being king or change his ways. He will be the perfect, righteous king forever. The perfect, preeminent priest, high priest forever. And his word that he spoke will last forever. So, I think all of these things point to when we ask the question, what does this show us about the Christ, about Jesus, is that Christ sits with Yahweh victoriously on the throne. He rules with God the Father. He rules as God. Secondly, Christ has ultimate rule over all people. Whether at this point they're enemies or those that are serving him freely and with joy, he has rule. Whether there are those against him does not diminish his rule. Also, Christ is a permanent priest and king. There is no other that will last forever. We can also see that Christ will judge. Okay. Verse 6, he will execute judgment among the nations. Christ will judge. And also, Christ's strength and power will never diminish. He's victorious and rules with Yahweh. He has ultimate rule over all people. He's permanent in his rulership and his priesthood. He's a judge. He is the judge. And his strength and power will never diminish. Now, with all of these pictures of who Jesus the Christ is, it sets before us a really serious question. The question is, am I right now an enemy of God? The God and King, Jesus, or do I give myself to him freely? Receiving re-energized, as the New Testament talks about, new life, right? Am I dressed in clothes of his righteousness? And have I become a citizen of his kingdom? So which one is it today? Now I'd imagine that Many, most, if not all here, are followers of Jesus, the King, and serving him. So if that is the case, and you're not an enemy of God, you've been saved by grace, his grace, through faith. Okay, he's accepted you as a child into his family. You are a citizen of his kingdom, I think it's still valid to ask the question, am I offering myself to him freely with joy? Is my life a free will offering to him? It makes me think of 
Romans chapter 12. And that probably comes to mind to many of us. Where Paul writes, I appeal to you therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So we may not be an enemy of God. We may be saved by his grace through faith. Okay. But we can still have the Holy Spirit observe our lives and see if we are offering ourselves as a living, sac as a living sacrifice to God that's holy and acceptable. We are holy and acceptable because of the work of Christ. Am I living that? Am I remembering that Christ right now sits on the throne as ruler over all things, his kingdom will never end, even as all of the kingdoms that we know will end. They'll perish. But if you're a follower of Christ, you are in the kingdom of God. You are a resident, a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Right? Are you acting that way? Am I acting that way? Right? Many times, no, I don't. So if you're a follower of Christ, Psalm 110, marvel at the majesty of this king that's ours. His rule is perfect. His rule is just, is righteous. His rule is one with love, even as he judges. And if you're part of his family, he wraps his arms around you and says, come, I'm interceding for you with the Father. I care about you. So in response, what I hope my heart does and our hearts does is that we offer ourselves to him because he offered himself fully to us. So Psalm 110. Christ rules. He's the king of kings the Lord of Lords, his rule will never end. May our hearts ponder that and then our lives reflect uh, that reality. Let's pray.